And while I'm giving everyone a chance to get on, I'm just setting it up so that we are also going live on YouTube for anyone who didn't get a chance to register for today's session. Okay, well, we're gonna go ahead and get started. So good morning again. I am Carrie Kennegeiser. I'm the program coordinator for South Carolina Partnerships for Inclusion, also known as SCPI, S-C-P-I. Uh, and I'll be your host for today's session, which is on supporting young learners with dual sensory loss. Um, and our presenter today is Krista Olson from the South Carolina Statewide DeafBlind Project. Just a few quick notes before we get started for some housekeeping. Um, we wanna make sure that this is the best virtual learning experience for everyone. So this session is being recorded and will be housed on our YouTube channel. And you'll find a link for that um, on our website, which is actually already on our website. So people can watch it live and then they can also watch the recording of it um, if they'd like to. All attendee video and microphones have been muted, so you don't need to worry about that. If you have a question today, please feel free to put it in the Q&A box, which you'll see on your screen, and we'll do our best to answer it today. Um, if we're unable to for any reason, we will make sure to get back to you uh, with more information. If you have any other comments or resources, please use the chat to provide those. Um, and I believe Heather, who is our co-host today, um, has added some resources in the chat. And if not, she will be doing so shortly. And as a reminder, if you signed up to receive child care training credit today or CEUs, you must view this live session in its entirety on Zoom webinar. So our apologies to those who have tuned in on YouTube, um, but we need folks to be on Zoom webinar because it's a bit more interactive. Um, and there are certain restrictions and regulations we have to follow to offer credit. So if you are viewing live on Zoom webinar, please make sure to complete the evaluation at the end of the session. And as always, if you have any questions, you can reach out to us at skippy, S-C-P-I, at mailbox.sc.edu. And I will turn it over to Krista. Good morning, everyone. I'm Krista Olson, and I'm the technical assistant for the South Carolina Statewide DeafBlind Project. Um, I'm going to apologize in advance. I have a cold, so I might be a little muffly. Um, so just excuse me for that. But um, today's session, I'm going to talk a little bit about what a DeafBlind Project is um, and how we're partnered. And then I'm going to just talk about some very basic strategies for supporting children who have a dual sensory loss. So the first thing we're going to just talk about is the Deaf Blind Project itself. Um, we are partnered with the South Carolina School for the Deaf and Blind. We are housed there, so we actually have three different locations or three offices. Um, I cover the upstate area at the school itself. Uh, Robert Hill, our director, covers the Midlands area, and that's in, uh, he's got an office in Columbia. And Marcy Meacham covers the Low Country area with an office in the Charleston area. We also partner with the Department of Education and the University of South Carolina. So we're gonna start with some of the basics. Um, and this is, what is deaf blindness? And I don't think everybody wants me to read the full definition um, because honestly, it's, it's a little confusing. What I always tell people is the word deaf blindness is a misnomer. Um, so we serve kids that have any combination of hearing and vision loss. So a lot of the times when we talk about deaf blindness, the first thing that people think about is Helen Keller or somebody who's totally deaf and totally blind. Um, that covers a very, very small population of people that we serve. So what you need to know is that deaf blindness is any combination of the two. And that combination is going to cause communication issues. It may cause developmental issues and it's going to necessitate specific accommodations for the unique needs that are kind of created out of that. And the other thing that's really important to know is that not one of these kids is the same. We can have the same etiology, 
uh, some of the same backgrounds and the way that these things present can be completely different. Um, there are two definitions, one for early intervention and one for school age, um, but basically the need is the same, the way that we would intervene. So as I kind of spoke about, you can see there's um, kind of a spectrum here. And so we look at that vision part in it. So we could go from a child who has low vision, maybe just um, some neat acuity needs, and then maybe profound hearing loss. So um, maybe a sign language user, but still is using their vision. Or we could have somebody who has a mild hearing loss, but maybe completely blind or have severely impacted vision or field loss. So they're only seeing kind of out of the central part of their vision. So really it kind of runs the gamut. And that's why I say, even with the same etiologies, we may see a very, very different range of use of those senses. So again, the most important thing to know is that as long as we have two of those things identified, as long as we have a vision loss and a hearing loss and identified, they would qualify. And if you ever have seen me present or you ever see me present again, you will see this particular slide. I think I included in everything that I do. Um, and that is that the deaf, deaf blindness is not deafness plus blindness. It is deafness times blindness. And so it's, it's compounding each other, not just adding to each other. And the best example that I can give for this is that if somebody has a significant hearing loss, um, a lot of the times our modifications are going to be visual. But remember, if we also have a vision loss, then we can't necessarily use the visuals the way that we normally would. And the same goes in the other direction. If a child is totally blind, we usually look at auditory accommodations, but we know that that might not work if the child also has a hearing loss. So the strategies that we use need to be very, very unique for that child's needs. So other information about what a deafblind project is, we are a state program. Every single state has one. We're a federal grant and we are no cost. And that's probably my favorite thing to tell people. Um, our services are free as my colleague would say with your taxpayer dollar. So uh, we serve birth to 21 or when they age out of school. And as long as they have that documented dual sensory loss. Now our Stipulations are a little bit different than school stipulations in that um, if you have a syndrome or a, any kind of etiology that's related to dual sensory loss, you will qualify even if you don't necessarily meet the needs for services at the school level. So an example of this is CHARGE syndrome, which we'll talk a little bit about in a future slide, but a lot of children with CHARGE syndrome have what's called a coloboma, which is a missing piece um, in the development of the eye, and it can happen anywhere in the eye. Well, sometimes this doesn't necessarily affect acuity um, or clarity of vision, but it may give them some blind spots or may affect the way that they function. So a lot of the times they won't meet criteria for school services. However, we know that that, that piece that's missing is affecting their vision in a way that's compounding their hearing loss. So that's just an example of some of the qualifiers Again, um, if you also, if you're looking to refer a child, especially in that early intervention area, if a child does not pass their hearing screening in the beginning, um, and we know that they have a visual impairment, we can put them on for a year. Um, there's, a, there's an I option where it says functional loss or documented loss. Um, and what we'll do is we'll say, we'll keep them on for a year and then follow up with you in a year to see if we have more medical documentation. So if you suspect a child has both, again, or if we're kind of in this flux stage where they're really, really little, um, please reach out to us. We'd be happy to go ahead and see if they can be put on our census and then we'll serve them for that year and then see where we're at the next year. We also have partnerships all over the place. So we have the, within the state, we have some partnerships. We've worked with quite a few organizations, um, vocational rehab, we're working with Skippy right now. Um, we've worked a little bit with the Transition Alliance and a couple of other organizations. We also are part of the National Center on Deaf Blindness. And so this is the entity that actually kind of oversees, they're not in charge of, but they are kind of the head of 
all the deafblind projects. So we get a lot of our information from them. And then we're also very, very closely connected with the other Southeast deafblind projects. And so Kentucky, Tennessee, North Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Arkansas, Florida, Louisiana, we partner pretty closely with them. Um, if you follow our Facebook page, which I believe is in our resources on the final page, and if not, I can put that in the chat pod. Uh, we also do a lot of trainings and we're picking up some trainings again in August. So if you want more information, by all means, join us on those trainings. So the DeafBlind Project does have several goals. Um, the first one, and we are a five-year grant, so we just renewed about two years ago. Um, so these may change over time, but always our first one is the DeafBlind Census. And this is basically just the way that we keep account of the number of children in South Carolina who have dual sensory loss. Um, it helps report to the government, to the federal government, and then that's kind of where our funding comes from. And so it's really important that we keep that number. Uh, families and teachers have the option to utilize our services or not, but we still ask that we count those kids to make sure that we have an accurate representation in our state. Um, the next component is early identification. So we do try to partner with a lot of the early intervention services and programs to make sure that we are getting those kids as early as possible and offering our support as soon as we can. We also do a lot of transition work. So that's, um, of course, we look at transition through the lifetime, but uh, then we also focus specifically on 14 and up. So we do sponsor some transition camps. We work closely with the Helen Keller National Center on some of their transition programs. So a lot of different options. The next one is family engagement. We do, um, we try to do family activities throughout the state a couple of times a year where we just do a fun activity. Um, we try to get some accessible handbooks and have some ideas for parents to include their children with dual sensory loss within the community. Um, and we also kind of, we help host a couple of support calls for families as well. So just different ways to get families included um, in the project and, and with other people, because this is such a small, unique group of students. It's nice to have other families who might have the same kind of challenges and also can celebrate those successes with you. Um, of course, COVID has impacted some of our events quite a bit. And so hopefully we'll get to do some more in-person things for now uh, in a bit, but for now we're doing a lot of online support activities for families. The next is interveners and qualified personnel. So making sure that we have people that understand deafblindness working with our children. Um, there's a whole slide on interveners, so I'm not going to get too much into that right now. But so that's another one of our goals. And then the other component is assessment planning and instruction. And that includes numeracy and literacy. So helping make sure that materials are accessible, understandable, and brought to students in a way that they can access, you know, understand and access them. So we provide a variety of things and I've talked about a few of them, but we do do some distance learning and coaching and we are working on increasing that a bit more since the COVID um, virus has been kind of keeping everybody at home right now. We will do consultations and observations in different environments. Um, at the moment, we're kind of on hold with that, but we could do videos within a classroom or within a home environment if we need to, um, if people are still looking for that. But what we would usually do is go into the home or go into a school and kind of see how things are set up, how the materials are being presented, how the student is engaged in their environment, and then give some information and help on how to support those needs. We do do a lot of trainings for staff and family members and community members. So like I said, we're doing, uh, we do tw two times a week webinars. We've done that all through um, shutdown basically. And we're gonna be picking those back up in August for everybody that wants to join in. And then in terms of the community members, a lot of the times I say, we can prepare our kids for the world as much as we want, but if the world isn't prepared for them, um, then they may not have the access that they need or want. And so I've uh, done, and I know Marcy has also done a lot of outreach with different organizations. So we have a partnership with the Children's Museum here in the upstate. Uh, we've done events in different places. And every time we do an event, we usually do staff training so that 
those people also know how to work with our kids and how to make those things accessible. Um, we will help with assessments when that's needed. And so sometimes that means training on the assessment. Sometimes that means helping writing the report. Um, sometimes it means just helping with the assessment and interpreting the results. So depending on the needs of the team and the child, we can kind of tailor that. We can help determine and develop appropriate materials. So we may help create things with or for you. Um, and also just kind of talk about the things that might make things a little bit easier for the child to access their everyday environment. We do have a lending library. This includes um, books and actual physical materials. And so we often say, if there's something that you wanna try that you're not sure if the, the district is ready to pay for it, if we have it in stock, we're happy to lend that to you. We don't necessarily have a time limit on our lending, although if we know that it's working, we would definitely pass that off to the district. But um, we also have, like I said, equipment. So that could be any kind of different supplies that you might think of. And if there's something that we don't have, um, you can say, hey, I'd like to try this out. Is there any way that we can get it? And we can try to order that for you and ship it off to see if it works for that student. I talked a little bit about the family fun events. Like I said, we've done the children's museum, we've done the zoo, we've done the aquarium. Uh, we have done a couple of sporting events. So we've done soccer games and we've done hockey games. So just different fun community activities to get families together. Same thing, I've talked a little bit about transition and family support. And then we do try to um, partner up with lots of different agencies and different support systems so that if there is something that we can't do or that we don't have the information on, we can get you connected to the right resource. Hi, Krista. Um, can we take a second to switch interpreters? Absolutely. Thank you. And I'm not sure if we need any picture descriptions, but just in case um, that bottom picture on the right on that last slide was of a parent wearing simulation goggles and earplugs and they are making themselves uh, cookies and pouring themselves a drink. So we'll do some of those simulation activities for families and for staff to understand some of the hearing and vision loss that their child might be experiencing. These are some of the common etiologies of deaf blindness. Now this is definitely not an exhaustive list. So if you do access this PowerPoint, that link should be live that says additional etiologies. Um, a few of the most common ones, charge syndrome, which I spoke a little bit about before, excuse me, is the most common cause of deaf blindness right now. And it used to be that each of those letters stood for something um, that was part of the syndrome. So C was coloboma, um, H is, heart, A is atresia. So there's a lot of different pieces of that. Now there's a genetic marker for it, so they don't use it that way. Um, but those characteristics are still very common and almost always it includes hearing and vision loss. Usher syndrome is um, also another common cause of deaf blindness. And what happens in that syndrome is typically the child starts off with hearing loss at a variety of levels. There are three different types. Um, and then they eventually begin to lose their vision. Some of them earlier in childhood, um, most likely it's more teenage years and up, they start to lose that vision. Um, I'm not gonna go through every single one of these syndromes, but these are some of the more common causes of deaf blindness. And so when you fill out a census form on a student, you'll get these listed plus probably 80 or hundred more um, options. And so if your child falls into any of those categories, we will certainly follow up to make sure that they are getting the services that they may need. I will also qualify that by saying we are a request service. So we may reach out in the beginning when a child is put on the census. Um, but we also will have a box that says the family's not interested in services right now. So if they're not ready for us, we won't help them. We will do periodic check-ins, but Again, we are request only. We will not come after you and say, you need to do this or you need to do that. We want to be there as a, as a help, not as something that makes you feel uncomfortable. <laughs> so, you know, again, feel comfortable putting your kid on a census or asking us for more information and know that we won't, we will try not to make it as uncomfortable for you as possible. So now we're gonna get into kind of the meat of actually supports for deaf blindness. And the biggest thing that we need to know about deaf blindness is it is a disability of access. 
When we look at vision and hearing, they are both disabilities of the distant senses. So we know that to get information, things need to be in a closer proximity. Um, so we're looking at access to your environment, all that information that happens around us, communication, your learning materials, social skills, it impacts job skills, your recreation and leisure. Um, so we've got a lot of different areas to cover. So how do we meet the needs of these students with these unique sensory losses? So there's a couple of different areas that we consider. Um, that first thing, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about this is assessment. And as educators, um, and I'm assuming that's who we probably have on this call right now, um, assessment is what drives everything. And so when I first started teaching, I, you know, assessment was the, the obligation, but after, you know, some time in the field, it was really important to me to get quality assessments on our children because it really does drive the supports that they need. And I know I'm probably preaching to the choir, but I know sometimes it just feels like, oh man, I have to do another assessment. Um, but these days I think I feel more in the, in the area of, yes, we get to do an assessment and we get to learn more about this kid, um, especially when we're looking at dual sensory loss and those needs are so unique and so specialized. The next piece besides assessment driving all of that information is communication. This is probably the thing that is impacted the most for our kids with dual sensory loss. Um, again, because we look at those things like um, if the child has significant hearing loss, but they also have vision loss, then we may need to adapt the way that they're ac accessing sign language. So, you know, they may not be able to see an interpreter across the room or in a small box on a screen. We may need to be really creative about the way that we're providing that access. It may need to be tactile. Um, same thing for written information for a child who is blind or that environmental information that goes along with communication. So the nonverbal cues that come with our faces, um, all of that stuff impacts communication. And so that's probably the biggest area that we address regularly. Um, social emotional is next. And that's again, if you think of some of those nonverbal gestures or how to enter a conversation while people are in the middle of talking um, or if your teacher is angry with you, or if your mom is upset when she comes home from work and maybe this isn't the best time to ask her for an extra ice cream. <laughs> so those kinds of little cues that our kids might miss. The next is home and school routines. And that's heavily impacted because a lot of the times when we look at a child who has dual sensory loss, everything happens around and to them. And so it really impacts their control. You know, all of us love to have our calendars on our phone and know what's happening and be able to plan for it. But a lot of the times in a school environment or even a home environment, it's, it's a lot of, well, we're going to art class now, let's go. And so they get moved into art class with no real warning about that coming. Or we're about to do this in their centers, we're just gonna put you at the center because it's the first one. Whereas maybe all the rest of the kids have a choice or they get to see and then they can kind of na navigate accordingly. Um, physically navigating the environment is another component, um, typically unique to kids who have vision loss, but then you add the hearing component and a lot of strategies that we use for a child to navigate their physical environment who have vision loss, we're using auditory methods. So again, we need to get creative about the way that we are teaching them to be efficient in their environments. And then the last one, um, and I'm not sure how much experience everybody has with this, but when a child has dual sensory loss, a lot of times that usually includes a lot of additional needs, whether it be physical, cognitive, um, different therapists. And so a lot of the times co coordinating the amount of people that are working with that child is a challenge. And so that's another little piece that we have to keep in mind is how do we keep everybody communicating and on the same page? So we're gonna look a little bit at a couple of different areas here. The first one is assessment. Um, something that's really important to know is there's not a lot of assessments that are normed for our kids. They're not appropriate most of the time. The questions don't necessarily meet their needs or 
they don't necessarily have the experiences that they need to have to be able to answer them appropriately. And so um, if a child has an identified vision loss, they are still going to qualify for a functional vision assessment, a learning media assessment, and an expanded core curriculum assessment. And for my um, non-vision teachers, who I'm sure we have quite a few on this call, a functional vision assessment looks primarily at the way a child is actually using their vision. It's different than a medical assessment. It's looking at print size. It's looking at how far they need to be from things. It's looking at color needs, contrast needs. A learning media assessment looks specifically at whether a child is a braille reader, a print reader, or an auditory learner. Um, and then for children with additional needs, we may look at other sensory components for learning media. So we may look at physical movement. Um, we may look at taste and touch and quite a few different options. And the expanded core curriculum is something unique to, to vision, which is basically all the things that a kid might miss um, when they don't have full use of their vision. And so that includes social skills, that includes career skills, recreation and leisure, using devices to access their environment. So a plethora of things, but we may need to adapt some of these assessments so that they're appropriate for our kids. And so some of the assessments that we use that I've listed here are unique to kids with deaf blindness, although they can be used outside of that area. The first one is the communication matrix. If you have this PowerPoint, this is a live link, but this is a free resource. Um, Parents can use it, teachers can use it. And what it does is it asks basic questions about how a child communicates on different levels. So pre-intentionally, intentionally using more conventional communication versus unconventional, excuse me. And it provides you a really beautiful color-coded chart that says, you know, this is where this child is functioning. This is where some of their skills are emerging. And then it helps you kind of create goals based on those needs. So if we know they're emerging in some of these areas, we may want to target those areas. Again, a free resource. Um, you, there is some options where you can get more information and pay like an additional $6. We do have um, an agreement with the company so that if this child is somebody who has dual sensory loss, we can actually go ahead and get that follow-up information for you. The Callier Azusa scale is the second one listed. This was also designed for children with deaf blindness. This is just an ordinary rating scale. It's an older tool, but it's worth noting because it is one of the few designed for our kids. Home Talk is a family assessment. And this is basically, it's a packet that the family can fill out about how their child functions at home. They can share it with the school team. And then there's a component of it where you can actually help build goals together with a school team as a family. The infused skills assessment is the expanded core curriculum assessment for children with additional disabilities. And this is also, um, it's an observational slash kind of a checklist assessment. Can be very, very useful. It looks at how a child interacts with objects versus people and helps you kind of target where you need to work with that child a little bit more. The sensory learning assessment is what I usually call my baby. Um, it, this is the one that looks at all of the, the needs that a child might have. So we're looking at hearing, vision, taste, touch, movement, um, smell, basically everything that could possibly help that child interact within their environment. The next component is the classroom observation instrument for educational environments. So this is a tool that we could use within a school setting to see if everything is set up appropriately for the child. Are they at the right distance? Is their equipment placed appropriately? Um, are their teachers accessible in terms of volume if we need to or vision? So just a lot of different things. And then the last component is the informal functional hearing evaluation. And this was created by the Texas Deaf Blind Project. And this is very similar to what we look at in vision. So as opposed to looking at that medical component, we're looking how they function in the environment. Um, and a good example of this is a student that we, I worked with and I still work with for a number of years who his hearing loss, if you look at the audiogram, um, can be fairly significantly impacted or it may indicate certain levels of hearing at different things, but we put him in a room to assess that had a lot of hard surfaces where things bounced off the environment and it didn't matter how loud the sounds were if he wasn't familiar with the sound or what the object was it was as though he hadn't heard it. So we banged pans, 
right next to his head, never registered it functionally. But if somebody knocked on the door, he turned right away. So that's that functional component where we say, okay, well, the medical reports say this, but what are they actually doing? So when we look at communication, and this is really important for our kids who may have additional disabilities too, conventional communication looks like speech, signing, print, braille, even our PEC symbols that we're used to using or the augmentative communication systems, those are all conventional ways to communicate. But the other important thing that we need to look at is the unconventional communication. And so it may be that gesturing. Um, it may be pointing, it may be, especially you may know this with little ones where if they're not really sure how to do something on their own, they may grab your hand and have you activate something for them or bring you to the area. So that's another way that they're using communication, but it's not necessarily that conventional or independent communication. There may be specific vocalizations that they use for certain things. We may see eye gaze so that they're shifting their gaze because that might be the one thing they can control is their vision um, and that motility in their eyes. It may be facial expressions. And this one I always tell people to cue into and make sure that you speak to parents on this one because if a child has any kind of palsy in the face or any kind of other muscular issues, we may not read their facial expressions accurately. So it may look like a grimace to us, but the parent might say, well, no, they really, really like that. That's a smile for them. So things to cue into, body movement is huge. So I know I have a one and a half year old, my daughter kicks her legs sometimes or used to when she was really excited. But we also may see things for kids that may be a little bit more hypotonic or um, you know, tight or loose in their muscles. You may see that once something enters their environment, they tense up or they completely relax. So those kinds of body movements are important to note as communication as well. And then the same for breathing changes. For our kids that may be severely impacted, we may see when something new is in their environment that respiration changes, they start to breathe a little faster. Or if it's something that's really calming for them, you may see that breathing calm down. If you guys will excuse me for just one second, I just need to wipe my nose really quickly. Sorry, I have this cold. And these are just some pictures that kind of demonstrate those different communication needs. So that first picture on the left is a child who actually uses tactile sign with one hand for um, receptive communication and then expressive communication, he's using symbols. The second picture is a child who's using large print to, icon to access his information. The third picture is a child using an iPad with a communication app on it. I believe that's Perlo Quota Go if I'm not mistaken. And the far picture on the right is um, one of our mentors at one of our transition institutes. She's on the left with blonde hair. She has Usher syndrome. So she is actually, the person on the far right is interpreting for her. The person behind her back um, is giving her environmental information. So everything that's happening in the room or some of those nonverbal cues. So if the student that she's talking to in the blue shirt and the red jacket um, were to nod and she were to miss that that can be given to her as information on her back. That's called haptic communication. And we do provide some trainings on that as well if you guys are ever interested in that. So some other strategies. Um, I always talk about what I call a student's bubble. So once we kind of know, once we have a functional vision and a hearing assessment, we have an idea of what distance and what areas we need to be providing communication and information. So if I know my student's best vision and hearing is within three feet centrally, I need to make sure that all sign language, if that's what they're getting, is there any speaker is in that area or their information that they're getting in terms of written communication is there as well. If I know that our student only has central vision, I'm not gonna put a piece of paper on their left. They may never see that it was there. So knowing that that information is really important. Um, but the other thing that we need to consider is that even though they may have a very specific bubble for most environments, there are certain things that can change that bubble. Excuse me, and that can happen within an hour, it can happen within a minute. So let's say you're in the car with your family 
the child is accessing their information fairly comfortably within that vehicle. And then you go to a restaurant and the lights are dim and the noise is loud. So a child that may normally access sign language at a, at a three foot distance with their vision now has to use tactile sign language or may need some object cues um, because they can't access that information the same way in that environment. The same thing goes for if the person that they're communicating with is familiar with their mode of communication. That might change the way that we need to adapt things. If they've had any medical procedures. So if we've had a cochlear implant that hasn't um, been mapped or they haven't been taught how to use yet, we may be going back and using some more basic methods of communication. Or we may have a kid who's had major improvements from the implant or a hearing aid and so we can adjust accordingly. Or maybe we have some physical surgeries you know, that have happened to legs or arms that impact the way that they communicate or the distance that we need to be because they might not be able to get independently where they need to get. So being aware of where that communication happens best and then being able to adapt accordingly is huge for our kids. Um, let's take a second here to switch interpreters. Okay, um, the next area is some just timekeeping resources. And so we talked a little bit about um, those routines that happen for our kids. And like I said, all of us usually have a Google calendar or our iPhone or someplace that we keep all of that information. And for our kids, a lot of times those things just happen to them. So giving them a way to access that information with clear boundaries can be very, very helpful. So these are just some examples of timekeeping resources. The one on the top left um, is lighted. So if the child has vision, they can see um, if it's green, we still have plenty of time left. You can actually customize when the light changes. So when we get to a five minute marker, it'll go yellow. And then when it's done, it'll go red, but it also has an auditory component. So depending on what they're using to access, you can use those. Um, the one in the middle on the top is just a visual accommodation. So that red, as the time counts down, turns to white, so that goes away. The one on the top right is called iPromps, it's an app. And this actually, you can set up a schedule and the child can click on the area. And then for this one, it's washing hands and it probably had a minute timer and you can see that green bar will start to go down. So it gives them a really good parameter, a very clear parameter um, of what the activity, what the expectation might be, and how much time they have for it. Um, the one on the bottom left is just a first then chart. So for kids who have just a basic, we need to talk about, you know, they really wanna do the fun thing, the computer. Well, we have a really clear way to say, first we do work and then we do computer. Some kids may need more than that. It may be, you need to do 10 problems and then we do computer. So you can always adjust these accordingly, depending, you can add time limits to this. It just depends on the kid. And the last one is just your regular alarm on your phone. You can set that up with vibration and sound. And that can just be a nice simple cue that blends in with the environment a lot of the times because most people use their phones for that kind of thing. So just a really, like I said, something that doesn't take a lot of extra that you can just have on your phone for a child that can access that. The next is calendar systems. This is my, besides the sensory learning assessment, this is my second baby. And this is basically a way to set up information for a child throughout the day, but you can expand this to weekly, you can expand it to monthly, um, and you can even do it within an activity. So it can be customized in any way. So what you'll see on the top left, and I can do a full day training on this, so please know that you're getting a very small piece of this. Um, the top left picture is just small symbols or small objects to identify what's happening throughout the day. You will notice that even though we have small little items on there, there's also a printed word. And I always encourage teams to do the printed word as well because that makes it more consistent for everybody on the team. So for a person that might not know what that little K represents, they have the word and the language that's being consistently used on the top of that card as well. The second one that you see next to that object symbols on the top um, area, the top row, 
is a regular picture symbol calendar that you may see in a classroom. Um, just basically seven o'clock, we're gonna do circle time and I can't see the picture super clear, but you know, 2.30, we have the bus, three o'clock, we might have a snack. So just laying out that day. Um, and again, these are gonna be individualized for each kid. The one to the right of that is an actual, um, this is an all-in-one board, which is available through the American Printing House for the Blind. So if a child has identified vision loss and are receiving services, this is something that can be paid for, uh, well, it's covered with your taxpayer dollars um, through their teacher or the visually impaired, this can be ordered. And so it's got a felt side that provides high contrast and then the other side is white and it's magnetic. So also more contrast, but that, actual activity there is looking at probably a lunchtime activity. So it may be a choice board or it may be in order. So that maybe we're eating cereal first and then we're doing this other fun activity and then you can listen to music or it may be choice. You know, do you wanna eat this first or do you wanna eat that first? And you'll see there's a full size spoon on there as well too. To the right of that is just a plain written calendar where the child can check off each activity as they do it. Um, and that particular child, that's one of our students that we serve that's probably three pages of information because he likes to know what's happening through the entire day. The one to the right of that is another one of the eye prompts from that last slide that we saw. Um, and that's basically how it's set up as a calendar throughout the day. So that child can just check off each activity. The bottom left is real objects, but smaller versions of them. So you'll see this is actually a nighttime routine or, or parts of it. So there's a piece of a diaper, there's a piece of boxer shorts for getting dressed. There's a part of a toothbrush. So things that are tangible that the student will understand. It has to be meaningful for them. So giving a child a small toilet bowl, if they're a child that's using a diaper, wouldn't be meaningful for them. We'd wanna use something that they actually encounter. The next one is just a visual schedule, but it's done with photographs. And then that bottom right is full real objects. So this was, um, the, the, the kids day was set up as each activity was in its own box. And so you'll see a meal time is that plate and that spoon. And then once he finished with that, he could close that box and then move on to the next one. Um, another strategy that we love to talk about, and this is um, very common in the world of deaf blindness, but honestly, I would say this is probably good for all children. And that's the hand under hand strategy. And that's basically a lot of the times as teachers, we have the tendency to grab a child on the top of their hand and then manipulate their hand into something. With our kids, their hands are sometimes their main mode of control and exploration. So if we put our hands over theirs, it's almost like when people walk up behind you and cover your eyes and say, guess who it is? Um, we're taking away some of that control. Um, so there's a lot of benefits to hand under hand or underhand in terms of that lets the child move away if they're uncomfortable, but it also helps model things. So let's say, so it basically looks like this. I'm going to kind of try to show you if I have my, this is the child's hand. I would put my hand, well, I would put my hand under their hand and then they would ride my hand and I might do something. So like opening a jar, I can actually teach that movement while they feel on top. I could slowly move my hand away and give them more independence with it. If they're really uncomfortable, they can remove. So it gives them a lot of control over what they're doing. And it also gives them um, a little bit of a precursor to tactile learning. So if they are going to be a tactile learner, this is really, really helpful. And it's just a way to be respectful of that child's body and space. I just got a 15 minute reminder. So I'm gonna try to move through some of these other ones. These are just some accessible identifiers. So if a child is experiencing significant dual sensory loss, you may wanna have something unique to you to help identify yourself. So it could be if the child has vision, you can do something as simple as a name tag or your name badge you know, that hangs on a lanyard. Um, if you see the middle one has got some little tactile symbols or you could do something unique to what you wear. So if you see on the right, it's like a cush ball bracelet. Um, so you may wear that every time you work with the child. So they have a way to know this is a person that I'm familiar with. This is who I know. Um, so it kind of sets up the activity and makes them comfortable. The next is literacy experiences. And so we're big fans of doing what we call experience books or experience boxes. And this is basically involving the child in literacy. So you may take a field trip and have the child pick up items while they're there or take pictures if that's something that they can access and then you create this book together. So you see the top of the left side is the pictures 
and it's labeled chickens eat seeds and lay eggs and it's a picture of a chicken. Um, the middle one is actual real objects and so they picked up tree uh, leaves and sticks and things like that and then they put you know I saw a tree with leaves while we you know they probably went on a nature walk. Um, the one on the top right is actually for a doctor's office so getting a child ready to go see somebody so it can prepare them for that experience. So these books can be used to increase literacy, to prepare things, to recall information, and then they can take these books home, they can keep them in school. Kids love things that are personal to them, especially at a young age, so they can go back through these. So we'll see a lot of times kids will just flip through their own little books because it means something to them. But again, we're also increasing that language for them. The next is defined spaces. And so if you'll look in this picture, this is basically just making sure that we keep our environments consistent and in a way that kind of a differentiates what the activity might be. So in this area, there's a rug that defines that play area. I'm sure every one of those shelving components has specific types of toys that the child can find independently. Um, then we, you know, we move off the rug. We have our active learning environment, which I'll talk about in just a moment, but that what looks like the cardboard box. And then there's another active play bar. And so everything kind of has a different texture underneath them, um, is very organized so that they can really navigate that environment independently. And these are what are called active learning environments. And this is basically a way to get our kids who may not be moving on their own or motivated to move because hearing and vision oftentimes are what motivates our kids to move without outside of their body. Um, so these are small environments that are set up very intentionally. Um, they can be placed around the child or on their wheelchair tray or over their desk or even their hospital bed to get them to kind of interact again more independently. So it, in the beginning, it may just be that they kind of have a spastic reaction and their arm hits something, but it's going to activate a sound or a texture. And we're going to keep those things in the same place so that they can consistently expect that that thing is going to be there. Um, and so eventually they'll start to be more intentional, like, oh, I like that sound, or I like the way that feels. And so we may see a routine create, like they create their own kind of, well, I'm gonna do this one first, and then I'm gonna do this one. And it becomes this more intentional movement. So for our kids who are maybe more physically involved, this is a really good way to start getting them to do things, explore a little bit more independently. And I should say that's Marcy's, uh, my coworkers, passion. And so if you guys are interested in that, she does wonderful trainings on that. Uh, the next slide is about interveners. And an intervener is what we would look at as mostly a paraprofessional in most environments. This is somebody who may serve in that role, but they have unique training in deaf blindness. And so their job is to provide one-on-one -on -one access for the child with dual sensory loss. This can be environmental access. It can be communication. They may help provide materials or make materials they are different than a paraprofessional in that their, their main duty is that student. So they aren't gonna have bus duty. They shouldn't have lunch duty. They're gonna be much more included in IEP meetings or IFSP meetings. <coughs> Excuse me, there are tools to determine if a child would benefit from an intervener. Um, and we can certainly help provide those if you have any other questions. I wanna make sure we get to some of the other information. So I'm gonna keep moving. Um, and these are just some pictures of people with interveners. So there's a child doing a clicking activity and there's an adult standing next to them helping make it accessible. There's another one where their child is sitting on somebody's lap and they're helping move a pinwheel. And then we have that haptic communication on the back and the right, providing that environmental information. Um, this is just a quick plug that we are partnering with Skippy um, and the State De um, Department of Ed to do the pyramid model. And so I know there's going to be more training in the fall with Dr. Jennifer Christian Brown on this and Dr. Donna Carpenter. So stay tuned for that if you're looking for that kind of support for early intervention. And this is just a quick quote um, about emotional learning. So we are certainly committed to, to supporting the social emotional needs of our children, especially during this time of COVID. And so this was the teacher of the year, I think the national teacher of the year. And she said, I think that social emotional learning is one of the most important things that we can offer our students in preschool and at all ages. It is something that every person needs and something that I plan to advocate for as national teacher of the year. And that's just important to know that we also are looking to support those social and emotional needs of our children. 
And this is just a kind of to tie everything up, um, a fun activity where I have this video of a student that I know uh, we will play the video in just a moment. And I just want you guys to, since we don't have a lot of time, I'm going to go ahead and just kind of tell you little things to look for in terms of communication. So we'll watch the video first and then I'll just explain it after. I mean, this is us being sick. Uh-huh. <laughs> Insley, are you jumping? Don't make me jump by myself. Insley, can you jump? Let's jump. So this child has um, a cochlear implant and she also has um, an eye condition that basically starts to reduce her outer fields of vision. So she has central vision right now. Um, and what I love for people to see in this video is it's not what you would lo typically look for at a communication video. Um, she's not using typical communication. And so these are those kinds of things that as professionals, you may wanna key into. So when she wants to jump more, you'll see her bend her knees a little bit or raise her heels. And dad, being a wonderful communication partner, is responding to that. So he will start jumping again. When she changed the motion and she started to pull her arms back, he said, oh, do you want to row? And he honored that communication. And so it was a physical movement by her, but he supported that. And then if you hear in the background, mom who's taping is saying, Ainsley, are you jumping? You know, and so she's helping verbally label those activities as well. And so... A lot of the times parents are, and, and professionals are doing this naturally, but they don't know that they're doing it, uh, that they're, they're taking all these natural cues and they're increasing communication. And these are the, some of the things that I was talking about when we talk about body movement or respiration changes. So you only hear Ainsley use one word and that's row after dad uses it. Um, but everything about her body and her language and some of those nonverbal cues are showing she's enjoying the activity, she's engaged, she's using ways to tell you that she wants to continue this activity or she wants to change what the activity is. So those are things that we can really help parents develop more and professionals so that our kids can continue to be more effective communicators. The next slides are just our contact information and please feel free to contact us at any time. Um, myself and Robert are here through the summer and Marcy will be back in the fall. And then there's a list of resources, including the National um, the, uh, Center on Deaf Blindness, Helen Keller National Center, Texas School for the Blind and Helen Keller National Center both have wonderful resources and videos. If you're interested in any information about literacy, cortical visual impairment, and they have a lot of information. Um, Active Learning Space is another wonderful new website that just came out this past year that has a lot of information about those environments that you saw in pictures earlier. Is there, are there any questions that we have? We've got about five minutes left. Oh, and a real quick plug, that first resource on this list is the calendars book by Robbie Bleha. It's out of Texas. Um, if you do order the calendar boxes through the American Printing House for the Blind, it comes with this book, but it is a wonderful, wonderful resource on how to start a basic calendar system. So starting from the very beginning for a child that might not have any communication or knowledge of what's going on throughout the day to building up to a yearly calendar. Um, it's what I called when I first started teaching, it's one of my, what I, my educational Bible for my kids with deaf blindness because it's got such great basic information and it's not a big read, it's a very easy read. And somebody's asking if we can go back to the slide before this one. And I apologize for the fast talking for both you and the interpreters, but I wanted to make sure we got as much information as we could. Oh, 
Any other questions or additional resources that anybody might need? Can you go to the contact slide, please? Absolutely, I think that's the one, yeah, right before that. And um, if you do follow, if you are on Facebook, you can do, um, just look up South Carolina Interagency Deafblind Project, and I'll type that into the chat pod. Um, and that is our Facebook page. All of our trainings go up there first. Um, so you can always follow us there. We do have the August ones up for registration now. And we've got some really good stuff coming up. So definitely check those out if you'd like. Somebody asked if we take referrals from childcare. I should have said that we take a referral from anybody. It can be a parent, a professional, in the medical field, um, anywhere that you think a child might qualify for services or you might have a question. If you go to the South Carolina School for the Deaf and Blind website um, and go to the outreach tab and find us, there is a link to our census form as well. But also feel free to just email me and I can mail you that census form and you can send it back to me if you have any idea that a child might qualify. We just say, go ahead and refer. We'd rather catch them than, than not, so. Any other questions? I really appreciate y'all jumping on with me and, and bearing with my nasally voice <laughs> and my fast talking. I hope you guys got some useful information. And again, please feel free to reach out if there's anything that you need or have questions about. We are happy to, to help in any way that we can. And even if you don't have a child who has dual sensory loss, if you're still interested in any of those resources, we're always happy to share. And thank you to Skippy and Carrie for having us on today. Thanks, Krista. I really appreciate your partnership. And this was, I know I've seen this session before, but just seeing it again too, I was like, oh, wow, that's cool. Like I was giving you thumbs up, but nobody could see me because my video was off. Um, but I think these are great resources that a lot of folks can use, even if they don't realize, or if they don't have a child that has dual sensory loss, um, other children with other needs, might benefit from some of those calendar supports, um, those tactile resources. So thank you so much. I, I learned a ton today. You're welcome. I, I agree. Most of the time, these are not unique to kids who have dual sensory loss. We can use these across the board. So I've thrown up um, an image of our website on the screen. You can always go there. It's scpartnershipsforinclusion.org to get more information about um, South Carolina Partnerships for Inclusion or Skippy. You'll see the contact us button at the top, which is circled. So if you have any other questions for our program, you can use that or you can email us at skippy, S-C-P-I at mailbox.sc.edu. Um, and if for some reason you forgot Krista's information or Robert's, you can always just use our email or our contact us button. And we're happy to forward that along to um, anybody that you would like to get in touch with. Um, in a few minutes, you're going to see an evaluation, not minutes, moments, you're going to see an evaluation pop up on your screen. Um, we appreciate you taking a moment to provide some feedback on today's session. And if you are seeking childcare training credits or CEUs, that is a requirement to complete the evaluation. But even if you're not interested in that, um, we really appreciate the feedback so we can incorporate it into our future trainings. Unfortunately, if you're viewing us live on YouTube, you don't have that capability, um, but feel free to send me an email if you'd like to give us feedback. Um, and again, on the screen, you'll see the arrow to subscribe. That will give you access to our newsletter, which just came out today. We send it out monthly, and we also just send out some alerts with things that are happening around the state, um, other resources, and things like that. It's a good way to stay in the know. Um, it'll also show you where our new Facebook page is as well. So definitely subscribe if you're not already. Um, 
And if you've joined by phone today and are viewing this through Zoom webinar um, and are seeking those child care training credits or CEUs, please send an email to us that includes your full name, first and last, the session that you attended and the phone number with which you used um, to attend this session so that we can make sure to link you up with the credits. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that um, evaluation up on the screen. I know we are a little bit over. If you could just provide us that feedback, we'd appreciate it. And thank you again, Krista, and thank you, Brian and Beth Ann, for being our interpreters today. We really, really appreciate your partnership. Again, awesome information. Thanks, Heather, for being our co-host. And thank you to all of you who are viewing live on Zoom and on YouTube. We hope that you've learned a lot and we hope to see you. Um, we have two more sessions today, one at 11 on self-care and one at one o'clock on some screen free distance supports for educators and childcare providers um, to increase family engagement for kindergarten readiness. It's kind of a mouthful. And then we do have two more sessions tomorrow. You can go to our website so you can check out um, the schedule as well. So it looks like we're at 78% completing the evaluation. We'd appreciate 100% because we do love feedback. So I'll just go ahead and leave that um, on the screen. And if you've completed the poll and you have no other questions, uh, feel free to exit off. But if you need to do the evaluation, please complete it. We're at 100%. Thank you very much. Well, thanks everyone. I hope you have a great day um, and hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.